Hey, thanks for the introduction. Uh, so my name is Winnie. I'm an Open Education Ambassador at Spark. And pri prior to this, I worked in an education nonprofit that served underserved students. Uh, and, and connected them with post-secondary opp opportunities. Uh, and before that, I was the student body president at the University of Houston. All right, and hi everyone. My name is Haley Babb. I also uh, work at Sparks Open Education team as an open education coordinator. I'm based in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Um, and I'm a former student union president, president at my university, the University of Lethbridge, where I studied psychology. So we wanted to share a few facts before we jumped right into our presentation. Uh, the first is that the average cost of college textbooks has risen four times faster than the rate of inflation over the past 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, another fact, 63% of students have actually skipped buying or renting a textbook, yet 90% of students have worried that foregoing these materials would negatively impact their grade. Yeah. So. Uh, I was the student body president at the University of Houston, as well as the director of the Texas Student Government Coalition, um, which spanned across 26 student governments in Texas. And one of the priorities for my administration was absolutely uh, focused on textbook affordability. And with that came the interest in open education and establishing an open pilot program here uh, at the university. So uh, the very first thing that I did when I got into office was send out a survey that would help us understand what the student body cost of textbooks are on our specific campus. Uh, I noticed that sometimes, you know, when you go to administrators with national statistics, there is a, a moment where administrators can be like, well, this is happening nationally, but we don't know if it's happening on our campus. So there's kind of a uh, a gray area to deny that potentially this is happening. And it's also good for you to know as the person who's going to be, uh, you know, pushing for this for textbook affordability from a student perspective where students are at. So uh, I sent out a survey to the student body and what we found were some really interesting statistics that I'll share in a minute. Uh, the second thing is we uh, went to the provost with those statistics and we uh, discussed, you know, look, we think that we need to bring an open pilot program, get faculty interested, um, start, start a committee. What can we do to get open education on our campus? And our provost was amazing uh, and reached out to the Dean of Libraries to um, start a pilot program that was uh, funded for $20,000 to 20 professors to try in the fall semester a year later. So in that year, we actually spent a lot of time uh, you know, bringing faculty to the table and asking questions, uh, you know, kind of common questions around open ed and why with the common questions that faculty have. And then also I was able to be a part of all of those meetings. So um, I was able to provide a student perspective as to why things were necessary. Uh, and then understanding and navigating the faculty concerns and issues came throughout the year. So here are some things that I learned. Uh, the first thing is that student voice has leverage and power. So many times faculty and admin are restricted in what they can say um, and what they can do about initiatives they're very passionate about. But students are the end consumer of any textbook affordability initiative or any affordability initiative in general. Uh, and students have a lot more leverage and power and are not really controlled by the administration um, at all at the institution to say what they want to say and to implement what they want to see happen, right? To correct wrongs on campuses. So student voice has a lot of leverage and power on the campus. The second is that it's critical for faculty to hear from students and to be proactive about textbook affordability. So in that survey I mentioned earlier, 60% of the students said that their most expensive book was above $200. 40% of students actually responded that the textbook alone has caused them to take fewer courses, not register for a class they wanted to take and or earn a poor grade. And then the biggest stat to come out of it that shocked me was that despite all of these concerns, 78% of students responded that they had never had a conversation with their faculty member about textbook affordability. So there's this gap between, okay, there's an issue and then potentially a feeling of student powerlessness, like, oh, this textbook is decided before I enroll in the class, there's no way I can do anything, there's nothing I can say, or um, I'll just have to, you know, change courses or whatever it may be, or bite the bullet. So it's critical for faculty students to hear from students, or faculty to hear from students and also be proactive. Uh, and then knowing your audience is key, figuring out what open means for them. So if you're a student advocate on your campus and you go to a faculty member and say, 
just say and hammer in that textbook affordability point. Uh, a faculty member is going to still have a lot of questions, right? So you need to know when you go to a faculty member what it is that's important to, to a faculty member in changing their text or introducing open to their classroom. And then what's important in an administrator? What do they want to know that's important for them, right? Um, fourth is that data is important when speaking to administrators. Uh, you need specific data that other uh, specific data of your campus and data of what other institutions have done to transition to whatever program you're trying to bring to the campus. So in this case, open. Um, so not only do you need that national piece or similar institution piece. So like if you are a big university, finding finding a big university that uh, is able to match uh, this this data, the data um, or match your campus statistics so that they can see, OK, this is another institution that's similar that's done it. Uh, but you also need campus specific data that works so hard uh, because they're not able to really contest your campus statistics right if you survey the students this is a problem there's no way to deny on campus uh, and then last is change happens fast and the right pressure is applied so this is more of a motivating statement for students um, there is always a way to get to the table with an administrator or a faculty member always. Uh, and if you find yourself uh, oftentimes ignored or felt like you're just not heard or you can't find the community that wants to start open, uh, you have uh, options other than just constantly sending emails or trying to get a meeting. Um, go to your school newspaper and say, I want to do an opinion piece on open education. Um, and that that is very, very quickly. You'll see change um, right away if that if that happens. OK. On to Haley. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Winnie. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to go next and just sort of talk a little bit about my experience. Uh, the reason we wanted to structure the presentation like this is kind of just to highlight that there is no one student story. There's no one student advocate story. Um, and there's no one way to mobilize students on your campus. Um, there's always such a different context uh, from institution to institution and between Winnie and I even country to country Winnie being American and me being Canadian we both had very very different experience um, in our roles as advocates. Um, but we've come out with a lot of very similar I guess sort of lessons learned or strategies to engage uh, others in this work. Um, and hopefully, you know, now that we are sort of both of us straddling a little bit the, the both the student world and now being in the professional world in the first few years, um, hopefully we can share some of those lessons learned with you. Um, but before I get into that, I just wanted to sort of give a little bit of background about, you know, myself and, and why I feel like I should speak about this. Um, so I uh, ran for student government. I was first elected uh, in uh, Canada in, in 2016 as vice president academic in my students union. And in Canada, those roles are structured as a full-time job. Um, so we have an office and we work 40 hours a week, which is, you know, usually a bit more than that. Um, but it's a full-time job in which, uh, you know, especially for a, a, my role, the VP academic is very internal focused. Um, and for a student coming in, um, you know, not only are you uh, trying to learn the ropes of your job, um, but it's very challenging to learn, uh, you know, the, the bureaucratic systems that govern your university, but also sort of the cultural nuances that go on around that. Um, and particularly for, you know, myself uh, being an undergraduate student at the time, and as well, I was the first person in my family um, to go to university. Um, these were some really big challenges that I sort of needed to navigate uh, right away. And one year was <laughs> barely enough time to do that. Um, so I didn't go into my role knowing about OER. Um, it was actually other student uh, government leaders, um, notably from, from BC, um, who, you know, introduced me to this idea at a conference. Um, and it really grew on me and it became something that I wanted to incorporate into my platform. So uh, alongside some other student government leaders in Alberta, uh, we ran a provincial campaign uh, called Textbook Broke Alberta, you know, based on uh, what we knew at the time, the Textbook Broke BC campaigns, but which also originated out of uh, US PERG. Um, and it was, uh, had a huge impact on my campus. Um, we were a campus that, you know, had a few advocates sort of sprinkled around um, but really didn't have a, a, a dedicated channel for making this work happen. Um, so that was something really big for us to kind of, you know, I, I actually was approached by, um, you know, uh, staff in our uh, university teaching and learning center. Um, there was a faculty member who reached out to me 
And then as well, and I, I know that this is <laughs> doesn't happen to everybody, but I actually had a representative from our bookstore reach out um, and say, you know, we know that OER is, is something that's gaining in popularity and we want to work, um, you know, with you to make sure that uh, this is something that, you know, we can be on top of, but also be supportive of students. And in Canada, our bookstores are part of an ancillary service, so it's not uh, a private uh, entity. So I know that that makes the dynamic a little bit different. Um, but it was that student, that campaign that really sort of brought all these like unlikely allies together um, and got everyone in the room for the first time to chat about this work and, and what we could do. Um, so through there, we were able to do a lot of lobbying uh, institutionally. We were uh, actually successful in implementing a, a, a grant fund um, for uh, faculty to start adopting these materials. And then through uh, some of the organized student networks in Canada, both at a provincial level and uh, at a federal level, we were uh, able to um, lobby this issue uh, to both provincial and federal policymakers. So that was very, very exciting to be a part of. Um, and then after that, uh, you know, it just became very important to me that uh, I felt like there were already some very established people who were doing this work. And I thought that was fantastic. And I so admired them. But in my mind, I was like, you know, if we really want to spread this further and make a change, then we need other students to be on board. And we need students to realize the power that they have to do this work. Um, so I, you know, kind of took it <laughs> upon myself to, you know, speak at a couple um, conferences and, and try to, you know, motivate not only students to advocate for this work, but to try and help um, faculty, librarians, other institutional allies um, to help students to do this work. So if we go to the next slide, uh, these are just sort of some of the strategies that I've learned in my time, specifically targeted at institutional allies who want to mobilize their students. I know, especially this year, um, it's been an incredibly challenging year. All the students that I've talked to, um, you know, it's, it's, it's very different to feel uh, or very hard for them to sort of feel ownership over their role or to feel like they can do everything that they set out to do under such strange circumstances. Um, so hopefully some of these, you know, will, uh, will help you to be able to, to work with your student government. So I'll just run through them really quickly. Um, first is establishing strong relationships with them. Um, and just because, you know, students aren't lobbying for this already, it doesn't mean that they don't care about this issue. Absolutely. Um, so something that you can do is identify, you know, are there students who are already uh, advocating for open education at my institution? If it's not your student government, um, are there, you know, clubs organized around this? Are there specific students who have uh, brought this up to their instructors or, or to the library that you know of that you can pull in? Um, sort of identifying what students are, you know, tapped into this already um, and what others are in a good position to do so and how can I connect with them meaningfully. So one thing that I uh, sort of like to recommend to people is to, um, and if, if your student government isn't able to run like a full-blown textbooks campaign, encourage them to communicate to students to talk about uh, course uh, material affordability in their course reviews. Um, this may not specifically connect to OER, um, but it, it's a way to sort of, you know, shift something in students' minds that say, you know, these books are expensive, but they don't have to be this way. Um, I, I know we only have a few minutes left, so I'm going to just speed through the next two. Um, maintaining momentum throughout turnover. One of the biggest challenges of student government is, uh, you know, uh, sort of maintaining connections with them once their year is over. Um, so identifying what or who represents institutional memory for the student movement on your campus. Here in Canada, our student unions um, have, uh, the majority of them have full-time paid staff. Um, so that is usually a great uh, avenue for you to go to sort of, you know, maintain longevity through turnover year after year. Um, and also thinking about how we can solidify goals through policy. So whether it's a, a, a resolution, um, whether it's, you know, just a policy statement saying this is something that we support and something that we want to continue working on into the future. Um, even if the council that comes after you, it's not one of their top priorities, it's still solidified in your, in your governing documents and it's something that you can come back to year after year. Um, and then amplifying impact, thinking about how you, as somebody who has a better understanding of the campus community, how can you bring students to the decision making tables? How can you, you know, pull up a chair beside you at the meetings um, where you're trying to advocate for this and bring a different perspective? And somebody who, you know, as Winnie mentioned, may be able to say things a little bit more frankly than you are. 
Um, so it's all about helping students realize their power and opening doors for them. Um, so no, again, how can I help student leaders, especially undergraduates, navigate the bureaucracy? What do they need to know? Who do they need to talk to? Who's in a good position to receive this information? Um, and then lastly, how can we publicly celebrate champions of open education? Um, you know, the way that uh, it worked out for me when I ran that campaign and sort of, you know, being the person to stand there and, and hold up the flashing light and say, you know, this is an issue I care about, that helped attract other people to me and it, and it brought more people onto my team to be able to do that work. Um, so how else can we be sort of like waving that OER flag um, and attracting our people on campus and, and maintaining a, a, a sense of community who can be working on this issue together? Yeah. So <laughs> that was awesome. Uh, so we have some common questions, which I think, uh, you know, we've had some questions in the chat already. So, um, you know, we can kind of start answering this question from James. Uh, how can faculty admin encourage student governments to take up OER when there are many other issues competing for their attention? So uh, Haley and I get this question a lot after any uh, ses uh, sessions. So the number one thing is that student governments often, there may be a more pressing issue on your campus. Every campus is so different and every, you know, every campus has their own different struggles. So even though your student government is not working on it, I promise you there are a million and one other students that are uh, interested about textbook affordability or want to be put on a committee or want to be in the room when these conversations are being had. So if you are reaching out to the student body president and you just can't seem to get to them, try the senators as well or other, uh, however they're structured, uh, each of them may be different. So sometimes they're senators or executive cabinet members, whatever it may be. You can try some of them as well. You can try reaching out to the administrator that usually oversees the student government or is their admin person. If that doesn't work, uh, you can find other students on the campus. So it doesn't have to be someone from student government. Uh, as long as there is always a room for a student um, next to you, then there should be a student next to you is kind of the idea. Um, okay, so any other questions? Haley, with the oh, candidate? Man perspective yeah I, I i feel like we could we could talk about this forever <laughs> 20 minutes is such a, a condensed time to try and, and get this to and it's something that you know i and i know Winnie feel so passionate about so um happy to take you know follow-up questions um through oe global connect uh i'll just i know we've got two minutes i'll try to answer one question there's what are the other reasons than affordability that students have to engage in oer um plenty <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to give my one minute elevator pitch, but um, there's tons of research. I know I know many of you as advocates, uh, you know, are aware of most of this already, but tons of research that says that, uh, you know, by by adopting these resources, students feel more compelled to, um, well, I don't really know how to put this. I guess research aside anecdotally, like when I'm a student in a classroom and I see that a professor has taken the time, you know, to, to acknowledge my situation as a student and say, you know, here's something that I want to do to ease the burden on you. I'm way more likely to really appreciate that prof. I'm way more likely to want to show up at their class every day. I'm way more likely to want to put in the extra effort for them if they're going the extra mile for me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> There's also uh, the, the diversity perspective. Um, where you know open books are more likely to reflect and, and and be diverse in how they're written or change to be that way whereas we've seen examples of Pearson and Cengage texts that are you know wildly uh, either inaccurate you know there have been quite a few scandals per se about that so um, open texts reflect diverse populations more and overall is a more equitable tool for students as well. 